And here we are again, back for the edition of Trey's Chowdown Live. And I'm here today with Chef Chad. Hey, how are you? Everybody good. And uh, we're going to get started with Chad in a minute. We're going to get started with our hot topics first. This is really interesting. You know what they did back today in 1883? No. Some guy decided to take some drugs and put them in some soda and call them Coca-Cola. Oh, there we go. <laughs> I'm pretty sure Wikipedia doesn't say that. I bet you it doesn't. <laughs> anyway, so yeah, 1883, they invented Coke, you know, which is a neat deal. Uh, Uber Eats, I want to talk a bit about Uber Eats. Uh, they, they have been going through some changes, and uh, they've been trying to do some studies because they've been... Uh, they've been kind of floundering, but uh, they, I think they've kind of got it, uh, got it going now. They did a huge study across the United States, and uh, they found out that 44% of the people in America from their study uh, have inquired about food being delivered. Can you believe that? 44%. That's a lot. That's a lot of people. Of those, I told you, I think we talked about this before, I thought it was going to be a price. Of those, the number one most important thing was service. Oh, wow. Could you get the food to them? Right. The third thing was price. Wow. Isn't really? that crazy? I would have said price one, but yeah. Yeah. Service. Yeah, well, service. Yeah. Service, 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 service. Means That's, everything. Means everything. Yep. Social social media has been a big part of that. For sure. And they've got a new thing on the fixing me on the market called Penny, the robot server. Really? It's a robot server. The company spent they've just invested thirty two million dollars. A company in Japan is funding them. Uh, they're giving them a, giving them money and they're gonna this robot's gonna serve people. And they're going to put it. In, they're going to try to test it out in the restaurant industry. How about that? <laughs> That's crazy. Yeah, it won't work. Not, you, not in my restaurant. No, it won't work at all. <laughs> <laughs> and I want to remind everybody that the meat board opened up in Fort Worth. It's a fantastic butcher shop and restaurant for lunch. They've got hand cut meats. Uh, you can get all kinds of awesome meats. They've got great burgers, steaks. You need to check them out. That's in West Fort Worth. It's called the Meat Board. Also, uh, Stefan Rochelle opened up his new restaurant, Wishbone in Flint. Uh, last week he opened up for soft opening, but uh, this week it opens up uh, for the for the grand opening. And if you haven't made it out there yet, you can get out to Wishbone and Flint. It's on the south side of Fort Worth, just outside of downtown Fort Worth, going south about a mile. There in the new new in the new district, and it's a neat concept. Uh, it's a very eclectic concept. He's got there's not one chair or anything in there. It's the same. Oh, it's cool. all eclectic, and they have a thing called the Amber Room, which is super cool. It's a it's a it's a like a, a speakeasy, a oh, throwback okay. to the speakeasy. And you got to walk through curtains. That's it's, it's a neat deal. That's cool. It's fantastic. All right, now we're going to get down with Chef Chad. <laughs> Chad, man, thanks for coming today. I really appreciate it. No problem. Thank you for having me. So, Chad, you're from Dallas. No, you're not from Dallas. Where are you from? Uh, I was born in Springfield, Missouri. Springfield, Missouri. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So, how long were you there? Uh, not long. I uh, moved to uh, Duncanville, just south of town, um, in uh, eighty. Uh, 84 maybe uh, so I've been I've been around uh, Texas for quite some time well you've seen a lot of changes haven't you uh, yeah. seen Duncanville since 1984 yeah so uh, it was still kind of farmland out there wasn't it uh, yeah uh, it was a real small town yeah uh, maybe about 30,000 yeah um, and you know there wasn't a whole lot past really past Duncanville at that point I mean Duncanville was pretty small but uh, it's gotten huge down that way, all the way through. I mean, basically to Austin now. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's all one one big conglomerate. Uh, that's know. for sure. I know. So how you how were you when you moved down there? Um, I started second grade in Duncanville and then okay. graduated high school there, and then I left after that and went to uh, Colorado State in 1995. Okay. So when how were you when you got the cooking bug? Um, I've always I've always loved to be around the kitchens and uh, with my mom and my grandma. Um, and you know, when I finally, uh, when I failed out of college, uh, I needed a, <laughs> I needed a job. And, uh, so I decided, uh, I was going to work in a restaurant as a waiter and, uh, that lasted for about a week. Rick, wait, but wait, you said you failed out of college. Did you truly fail out of college or were you just partying and having fun uh, and didn't go to school? No, no, no. I, I, I failed out. Oh, you I, failed out? Oh yeah. I was, okay. uh, I had a 1.4 GPA oh, wow. for three semesters. That's not then, for everybody. Yeah. They, they said, uh, I don't, I don't think we want you back here. I said, all right, well, I, I won't come back I, then. I, I didn't finish either, but it just, I just, I just couldn't sit still. To, I got ADD real bad and I couldn't sit still long I enough. think that's, I yeah. think that's a lot of what mine was, was yeah. just, uh, I, I can't do that. And so. Uh, waited tables for about a week, and the manager uh, told me I was not good. And uh, <laughs> so you didn't make it college, and they told you weren't good waiting tables. Yeah. So he had uh, he had a um, a couple of kitchen guys down with uh, pneumonia, and this was in uh, Fort Collins, Colorado. And uh, he said, "Do you 
have you ever cooked before? I said, no. He said, well, let me show you. He's like, I, I, I really <laughs> like you. Let's, let's do this. And, uh, I mean, I loved it. Uh, and I thrived really fast uh, there. So uh, so one week in the front of the house, and you went to the back of the house. Yep. And one then, week. And he, did, he sh- did he give you training, or did you, throw you, did you learn by fire? Uh, kind of both. I mean, he would train me during the day, and then I'd be on the line at night. Okay. So um, it, was, it was fun, man. I loved it. And so my mom and dad said, uh, well, why don't you go to culinary school? I said, uh, okay, yeah, I mean, why not? So <laughs> I started at uh, 19 years old. Okay, see, I never, as many times as I've talked, I've never asked you about culinary school, so this is great. Yeah. So you went, to, what culinary school did you go to? So I went to the uh, Culinary Institute of Colorado. Uh, oh, cool. In uh, Colorado Springs. And uh, it's in a community college. It's a lot like the El Centro program sure. here in town. And I like that El Centro program. And, you know, they're moving out to the old Cord- La Cordon Blue building. Oh, are they? Yeah. Yeah, I did not it's, know. They're growing. Yeah. Uh, so it was, uh, that's what it was. I mean, uh, it was in a, it was in a, uh, Community college, and we uh, we served the kids, we served the teachers, we had a private fine dining spot for the teachers, and then we had a cafeteria for the kids, and we did everything. How so, long was the program? Uh, two years. Two years. Two years. It, so it's just like going to college, then basically. Yeah, yeah. You got your associates and a culinary degree, basically. So what that. you found out was that when you had, when you found something for your passion, yeah, it was easier for you to study and learn. Oh yeah. So uh, three point nine GPA, <laughs> president of the class. Yeah. <laughs> it, was, it was big crazy. difference, isn't it? Yeah. Very, big difference. Very big difference. So two years. So what was your? Did you work at all? Or did you just go to school? No, I worked every day. You know, worked every day. Okay. Yeah. Did you have to work as an internship when you were in the school, or, or did you do I it did. just because you wanted to? Uh, I did my. So my internship was back here in Dallas uh, at. Uh, Crescent Hotel at Bonash. Oh, wow. Uh, that was in 98. I uh, did that. After so. you left culinary school? Uh, no, I was still in. So, oh, so I you... started in uh, 97 in culinary school and uh, graduated in 99. But okay. I was working the entire time and then did a summer internship at Bonash at the Crescent. So for, for you, what was your most favorite thing at culinary school? What was the thing that, that, that grabbed your attention the most? That you could say, I learned, I loved, I loved this much about culinary school. It, 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 I learned this much. That was my favorite thing to learn. Um, probably the butchering of proteins. Um, oh, that's awesome. That was that was the one thing that I just could not get enough of was learning all the animals, how to butcher them, how to you know join where to cut them, joints and everything. Yeah, joints, yeah. everything, and then you know, presentation-wise, yep. what's going to make the best presentation piece of it all. And see, back then, people weren't doing a whole lot of that whole whole, whole, whole animal stuff. And nowadays, oh, my God, everybody wants to see it. Yeah. And I think it's a lot because of, of the Food Network and Cooking Channel and social media. Oh, definitely. I think social media probably plays a bigger part than the actual TV does. But it, it's, it, it's, it's become a neat deal. Oh, yeah, it's, it's definitely. And, uh, you know, watching... Watching guys and learning all the stuff and the parts and the way to do it is, you know, it's just crazy to me. Um, that's that's what I've done my whole life is butcher. <laughs> yeah. What was your what what's your what's your favorite part? What puts your favorite animal to butcher and cook? Um, or do you have one? Probably ducks. Ducks. Yeah. Uh, I'm a big duck hunter, so yeah. uh, you know, uh, plucking feathers and you know, learning how to. Uh, dress up a duck and learning all the you know good things about the duck and you know just cooking them the right way and See, making sure they're nice. This is why I love my show because <laughs> and this is why this is why I started and created this show this platform because there's so many shows out there for food and chefs but nothing where you get to learn about chefs. I never knew you liked to hunt duck. I never knew you could cut duck. Did you cook duck? Yeah. Oh yeah. So my ranch, I've got three duck blinds and three different big huge lakes where we ha- where they hunt ducks at. Oh man. <laughs> you, didn't, you never told me that. Soon. Yeah. Oh yeah. That's <laughs> uh, yeah. I go to two different spots. Uh, one in Jacksboro and one in St. Joe, and uh, I got. Uh, uh, family and friends that have big, huge ranches up there, and we go duck hunting all the time. I mean, so, that's my favorite. I loved, I loved eat Peking duck. Oh yeah, I ate the first time like 1987 or 88 at, from Herman that owns Sichuan here in Fort Worth, and I just love Peking duck. Oh yeah, I love it. Oh yeah, that's and there's there's an old uh, Thai guy that I learned under, and he did this black duck that was like a smoked duck with molasses and soy over it, and 
it was just awesome. I mean, the first time I tasted it, I was like, that's that's the best thing I've ever had. <laughs> and he would never tell me how to do it, and I've tried to recreate well, it. Was it a little bit years. of crunchy, too, the texture? Oh, yeah. yeah see, that, see that, that, that does it right there. <laughs> that I mean, that, that does it, man. It was it was smoked and then glazed and smoked and glazed, and it was just so yeah. sticky and crunchy and awesome, man. You know, there's a, there's a, there's a restaurant in Dallas, I think it's been open a little less than a year now, man, but they're in the new, in the, in the remodeled... Uh, what is that hotel across from uh, the park? Uh, they remodeled it's like a 1950s hotel. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Anyway, they have a Chinese restaurant there, and they have all these ducks hanging. Oh yeah. In 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 a, in a big glass case, and you have to order them two days in advance or oh, a week or something, and they cook it for you. And you go get it, but it's a it's a big it's a real. And I haven't done it yet, but I'm going to. It's just I have to have enough time to in my schedule to. <laughs> to I, as, my schedule changes in the food business a lot, so right. if I tell them I'm gonna be there in a week or two weeks, and it, it'll change. So oh, I guess yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's tough. Those are, uh, I know there's a bunch of those kinds of restaurants over in uh, Richardson that do yeah. like the, you can you can call ahead and order the whole duck and they slice it out for you and give all the sides. That's, oh my gosh, man, that's one of my favorites. So what what makes a duck, if a duck's real gamey, does that mean it's just old or not cooked right or what what, what, what makes it gamey? Well, there's, there's two different styles, okay? You have your farm-raised ducks, which is a cross between a pekin, P-E-K-I-N, and a... Um, uh, Moulard duck, all right? So yeah. that's mainly the ones that are served in restaurants. And then you have the wild ducks, like okay. you and I eat. Yeah. The wild ducks uh, have a lot less fat, um, and they have... Yeah, because they're out there working. Right, and they're yeah. out there working, and yeah. they're, you know, their heart's pumping all the time, so right. they taste more gamey or irony, you know, right. like sucking on a penny. Right. Uh, but the <laughs> ones... Good analogy. I mean, it's what it tastes like that's to me. You know? uh, the way to get that out of there is just cooking it the right way. Um, or and or marinating it the right way. Would you brine it, marinate it, and get to yeah. We usually uh, I usually do um, herbs uh, like fresh herbs, garlic, um, olive oil, and shallots, and you know let them sit for a couple of days before we you know even start the process of cooking them. But like with your with your um, restaurant ducks, you know they have the big fat cap on the breast right. part of it, and they just. They don't have that gamey flavor because yeah. they've just been fed corn. More of a fat, yeah, yeah. yeah. You know? Well, they've been sitting around watching TV all day and eating bonbons. Well, that's my basically. Favorite. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> that's what I want to do. Yeah, yeah. Well, you don't end up like them though. Yeah, I know, right? <laughs> and they're on the table, man. <laughs> I know. I know. I just got to cook those. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay, so you left culinary school. Where'd you when you left culinary school? So uh, I came back to uh, Texas. Um, I was working in a restaurant, a uh, wild game restaurant in Colorado, uh, for a long time. Uh, probably just over year and a half and decided to come back. Uh, what was back. the name of the Wild Game Restaurant? So it was called the Craftwood Inn, um, I-N-N. -N, and it, it was, was all Wild Game. It was all Wild Duck, Game. Duck, uh, uh, elk, yeah. buffalo. Venice, venison, venison, buffalo. Uh, in fact, one time the uh, circus was in town and they had an old uh, lion die, a male lion die while they were in Colorado Springs. And they called us and asked us if we wanted the saddle. And my chef was like, well, yeah. I mean, we've never had a we've never had lion. Let's what? do it. What? Oh my God, that's too much. Are you serious? I'm dead serious. Oh my God, that's a great story. So we uh, we decided we were going to go ahead and try this lion out and see if we could uh, cook it and serve it. Because you know, most time lions are doing the eating. Yeah, you ain't eating the lions. Yeah. <laughs> so it was probably the worst experience I've ever had. It uh, was gross. I mean, yeah. just so grisly. Yeah. Uh, because they eat meat. And, and because they're moving all the time, they're a yeah. very muscular, strong animal. Right, and it just it it was it was not good. So yeah. we we decided to scrap that idea, and we didn't even serve it. Uh, yeah. We we tried to eat it, and it was it was bad. I mean, he was an old old lion too. So yeah. you got two two strikes against you right yeah. there. But yeah, uh, so I left there, uh, came back to town, and hang on, what was your favorite thing to learn at that at the at the, at the place there? So uh, three, what, what was your favorite thing you took away from there? Experience? Um, three times a week. I had to butcher a whole deer, um, basically skin it. Uh, the only thing that was done to it was it was gutted. So you had to skin it uh, and break it down into four ounce portions and six ounce portions the entire deer. And I did that three times three a times week. Three times a week. Yeah. I bet you got good at that. You could blindfold yourself. Oh, yeah. Easy. Yeah, in the military, they blindfold you, make you take your weapons apart, put them back together. But right. these what you do with deer. Oh, man, I could do it. So easy. It's not even <laughs> It's not even funny. And so, the you know, all my, obviously, you're a hunter, too. Uh, all my family and friends, they always, you know, they always say, 
come come shoot a deer with us. I'm like, no. They, they no. want you to clean and cut it. They, yeah, and they're have like, you got a, have you got a caught on to that? Oh man, they they've <laughs> I've done it once for each family, and I said that's it. I'm done. I won't ever do that again. They're like, why? I said, look, guys. You know, when you start doing that three times a week for a year and a half, and that's all you do, and then, you know, you're always butchering something, I mean, that's just, that's a pain, you know. Yeah. It's, but it was it was one of the coolest things I ever learned, man. So on that note, what is the uh, what is the hardest thing to butcher? The hardest animal to butcher? Man. Uh, probably, probably a cow. I mean, to be yeah. honest with you, I mean, they're just so big and bulky, and there's so many different parts to yeah. them. And learning all the parts is the hardest thing, you know, and learning where to cut yeah. and make sure it's right. But, I mean, pigs are pretty easy, you know, and all the birds are simple. You know, they're all the same. Uh, once you get into wild game, they're pretty much all the same, too. Uh, Some of them are just real, real small. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> but like deer and, you know, any any of the kinds of deers, um, you know, even getting down into like antelopes and when you start looking at, rabbits and stuff like that they're almost built all the same way so it's real easy i like antelope yeah i love antelope. yeah it's good yeah when i was a kid man they used to we you know we had we had all our restaurants uh we had a place in a house in mexico and we would go across there those antelope would be just running running they don't do it anymore obviously but they were running man loose just jumping jumping fence stuff it was a neat deal oh yeah yeah they're super cool yeah um we we do two different i've done two different kinds of antelope we've done the little black bucks and then we've also done nil guy antelope, which is like a it's like a bigger version of the antelope, and their uh, you know their legs are more like in the thirty pound range as opposed to the little eight pound yeah. black buck yeah. legs. So, but super good. How much how much meat's on an average antelope? I mean, pound wise. Um, on a little black buck, maybe about thirty. Yeah, not a lot. Maybe huh? yeah, yeah, maybe thirty. On the nil guys, you're probably looking more in the like a regular deer size, maybe yeah. eighty to a hundred pounds. Yeah, something like that. So, that's cool. So you left. Okay, so you left there and you came back. You came back to Texas. Yeah, I came back to uh, Dallas and uh, Duncanville or Dallas. No, I, I came Where back to there? Dallas and uh, did uh, the Crescent Hotel for a little bit longer. That was um, a great experience, wasn't it? Yeah, I got. Um, I was working about 80, 90 hours a week. Yeah, and got rid of um, got rid of my student loans and all my debt, and was like, all right, this is awesome. Um, so a friend of mine told me about uh, this little restaurant and they were looking for a sous chef. And I said, well, let me see if I can apply and see if I'm good enough to be sous chef. Sure. Uh, that little restaurant was called The Grape. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So uh, I started in... Uh, That's two, a big deal. Yeah, I started in 2000 as sous chef at The Grape. And um, I stayed there for almost a year. Does it seem like just yesterday? Because 2000 to me seems like it was just yesterday. I seem like I remember everybody saying, oh, 2000, everything's going to crash. We're not going to make it. But it seemed like not. It's 20 years ago. Yeah, I know. And I look back and I go, oh, my gosh, that was 20 years ago. And I've been cooking for 24 years now. <laughs> I'm like, oh, my gosh. No, you've been, you've been, you've been gaining experience for 24 years. That's yes, what I'd say. <laughs> yes, for sure. For sure. For sure. So yeah. you left the grape. Um, so I left the grape and I went to, uh, I went to open my first help open a restaurant with these guys called 2900 um, and it was a little small bistro 50 seats uh, we changed the menu about every other week um, and just did all kinds of really cool Wait, stuff. what was that uh, where was it no when was it oh uh, this was uh, October 01 that's amazing because back then you know changing a menu a lot was it wasn't a big thing no no that was not it's now it's huge but it yeah. wasn't a big thing no nah, back then there was nobody in town was doing no uh -uh. i mean we did it and we had a great time i mean we would we had a couple of dishes that stuck around but i mean it was real seasonal it was real fresh and clean and you know that's what drew everybody i mean uptown this was in uptown yeah and uptown dallas wasn't big back no then. it was it was just getting kicked off yeah it was just getting kicked yeah. off and I mean, all the people in Uptown would come over to us in the Highland Park area, and they wanted something new every time. Yeah. So it was uh, it was really cool experience. I stayed there for five and a half years, and so well, five and a half years in the culinary was a long time. It's 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 super long. Uh, <laughs> we got a uh, we got a nod to uh, go to the James Beard House and cook at the James Beard House in New York. That was neat. How was that? Did you like that? That's probably one of the most nerve-wracking experiences you'll ever have in your entire <laughs> life. I bet so. Oh Tell me about gosh. that. Tell me about that. You know, I, James Beard, um, 
I love James Beard. You know, I'm all their email stuff, and I get and I read their stuff all the time to stay up on what's going on in the culinary world. Right. And I think they've done a lot of great, a lot of good for the culinary world. Yeah, for sure. Uh, the the man was absolutely just a genius and and knew what was going on and made sure everybody knew that the chefs in America were that good worldwide. And that's what he brought to the table. But the house is um, a little brownstone house. Yeah. Um, you would never know it was there if you didn't know exactly where it was. Uh, there's a small plaque on the outside that says James Beard House, and yeah. that's that's it. Uh, but the really nerve-wracking part about it is while you're finishing cooking or getting ready for the dinner to pop off, everybody walks through the kitchen and shakes the chef's hands on their way to go get their drinks and appetizers oh, started. Okay. So while you're plating stuff, for appetizer-wise, they're walking right through your kitchen, and you're just standing there. Oh, hey, good to see you. Oh, hey, good to see you. <laughs> you know, so it was, it was, it was very, very nerve-wracking. And I wasn't even the chef. Our the owner of the restaurant was the chef. I was exec sue, and I mean, it was, I was stressed to no end, man. It was How crazy. long were y'all up there? Um, they uh, chef was there for three nights. I was just there for. Uh, an overnight. I flew in the morning of. Um, he had driven up there to take all his food because oh, we've yeah. heard horror stories about the airport. About, about the airport. yeah, about trying to ship food up yeah. there and stuff like that. So he drove up there and then um, he stayed for three nights. That's a pretty good idea, actually. I think. Yeah. I. Yeah. Plus, you're seeing America. Yeah. And, you well, know, you got, you got all your stuff with you, man. Yeah. Oh yeah, and you know exactly what you got and how to keep it. You know. Yeah. How to make it fresh and whatnot. So, uh, I just flew up there the morning of and did the dinner and then flew back late the next day so i was in there for maybe 30 hours tops now they gotta have a big corporate office somewhere um so there is there is a little office it's not real big because it's all um it's all uh fundraiser i mean it's, oh, yeah. it's a non-profit yeah. kind of deal so they uh they probably that, farm a lot of their stuff out there uh their their um the, the pr stuff like that I would oh think. Yeah, yeah, yeah yeah so but it was uh, it was probably one of the coolest things I've ever done, and I would love to go back and do it someday. And you know, I I've, I've been given the opportunity, but I've also had so much on my plate that I couldn't yeah. do it at that time. So it's just you know it's one of those things. But what's the most fun thing you did at James Beard House, or just being in there? Uh, being there was really cool, and you know they have a they have a chef coat, or they have multiple chef coats yeah. that are signed by everybody. Yeah. And so, you know, sitting there looking at him going, oh, my gosh, this is, you know, here's Thomas Keller. And yeah. look right there on the wall. And he's <laughs> yeah. been standing right here. So yeah. it was it was a really cool experience. That's neat. Man. Really cool. That's neat. So you did that. Then where'd you go from there? So uh, I left uh, 2900 and I decided to uh, apply for my first executive chef job. And I told myself I'd like to do it before 30. And I almost made it <laughs> you almost made so it. <laughs> i if you want to look at it i did make it because my birthday was on january 3rd right. and i started on i i hired on with them before but i didn't fill out my paperwork until the 17th of january so gotcha. that was my start date but i was real close right in yeah there, that's so. you made it yeah so it was a little restaurant called cold pepper steakhouse out in rockwall um are they it, still there oh yeah are they? Okay. they've been there 38 years, I think. Oh, now. wow. So I started in uh, 07 out there and was there for 10 years as executive chef. That's a long run. Yeah, it was a stupid long run. So <laughs> so what all do they have there? What all do they have there? What's their menu like? So it's um, it's just steakhouse. Um, the owner at the time wanted me to change it from more of a country steakhouse where they had fried catfish right. and chicken fried steak and stuff like that. And he wanted it more brought up to speed with the Dallas Steakhouses. Gotcha. Um, like, you know, your Nick and Sam's or, yeah. you know, Bob's or something like that. So I changed the menu and brought it up up to date into the more popular, you know, areas. Um, did a lot more lobsters and fresh fish. Uh, we had, you know, four different types of fresh fish on the menu at all times. Um, bunch of prime steaks, uh, and then I started learning the dry age process out there as well. So we were, we built, we have a downstairs cooler, walk-in cooler that just held beer, so we decided to turn half of it into a dry age cooler. Oh, that's neat. And we were dry aging uh, ribeyes. Dry um, aging ribeyes and beer. Beer, beer, and, <laughs> beer and ribeyes. Uh, so um, 
We were, uh, I went to, uh, uh, I got a chance to go to a friend's wedding in Maui and we were watching them cook stuff, you know, cook the whole pig yeah. on the coals right. underground. I said, oh, that's hey. a neat deal. I've seen him. I haven't seen him in Hawaii, but I saw him do it on uh, do it on TV as neat. Oh yeah, dude, it was it was awesome. I was I I just stood there the whole time asking questions uh, yeah. to these big old Hawaiian guys, and yeah. they were telling me. So we got back home and we decided to uh, do what we called the caveman back then, um, caveman ribeye. So we would take the dry aged ribeyes, season them up, and we had this nice mix that I still use today for our seasoning, and we wouldn't grill them. We had a wood fired mesquite grill. Uh, we wouldn't grill them. We'd throw them right down into the coals and just char them. Oh my gosh, man! It was, oh, was it good? awesome. Oh, it was awesome. So, well, you throw them in the coals and you get them all charred black. Yeah, and, and then, the inside would be perfect. Oh man! Oh, uh, perfect. So you got bark on a steak, basically. Oh yeah, dude! It was it was amazing, and everybody everybody loved them, man. Cause see, to me, you, you know, I do that big uh, barbecue deal every year. Yep. Uh, list every year, and I've been working on them, fixing to come out. It's going to come out in about six weeks now for this last year. But I love bark. Oh, oh, brisket. Yeah. Oh yeah. If, if if the brisket can be good and juicy, but if the bark is not flavorful to me, it's not all my. It can't be. It's it. You know, it falls down the list. Oh yeah. No, I think that I I'd, I'd much rather eat the fat and the bark than yeah. eat the eat the meat at all. There's just a lot of flavor in there. Oh yeah, that's my favorite part. So, yeah. But yeah, that's uh, we did that, and um, we had a. Uh, I started really getting into wines, um, learning about wine when I was at the Grape, obviously, because it was just a wine restaurant. Um, but they, uh, we had, a I met a guy named Clay Moritzen out in, uh, Sonoma. Uh, -huh. uh he's in Healdsburg actually. And he, uh, is a world-class winemaker, super, super nice guy. And, um, he came and did a wine dinner with me. We, we did a bunch of wine dinners at Culpeper, uh, probably one a month or one every other oh, month. Oh, wow. Yeah. Um, and we do, you know, a full pair everybody. They're popular now too, wine dinners. Oh my gosh, yes. Um, but we were, I mean, we were doing these way back in the day and Clay came out, I met him and he came out and he said, he said, what's your favorite kind of wine? And I told him and he goes, man, you chefs are all weird. I said, yeah, I mean, we want to, <laughs> we want to, we want a different wine. We want something bold. We want something crazy. Yeah. And so it was Flavor. Called, yeah, it was called Petit Verdot. And, uh, he said, well, Petit Verdot, Verdot. Petit Verdot, yeah. And so he, uh, he ended up the next year, he said, hey, man, I need you to come to California and check this out. He goes, I got nine barrels of uh, Petit Verdot. <laughs> I said, okay. He goes, do you want one? I said, well, do I want one? Well, sure. So <laughs> we, did a, we did a wine, especially I went out there and picked out the uh, barrel that I wanted, and he bottled it for me. I did got, you taste the bag each barrel? Yeah, I tasted each. And each, each barrel tasted different. Yeah, oh yeah. Yeah. Very different. It was crazy. And he goes, which one do you want? I said, I want that one. So he barreled, he bottled it all up for us and sent it back and we sold it at Culpepper. That's and neat. it was, it was, hey, I want this steak with this bottle of wine until, you know, and everybody would walk in the door and go, what does Chad recommend? This is what Chad recommends <laughs> right here and right here. Yeah. And don't, don't, vary, don't vary from I it. I guess you know? sold a lot of it. Oh, yeah. We sold. Uh, How long would that barrel last? Um, it was 22 cases of wine. That's not that much, is it? Not, not when you think about it. It's not that much, but it was 22 12 packs of wine. So how long did you get last? Uh, we did two different vintages. We did 2012 and 2013 vintages of it. And it, I mean, we sold out within the year every time. That's so neat. We couldn't keep it in. It was awesome. So what? What? What was your? Is it? Was that your favorite wine, the Petite? Uh, it's it's one of them. Yeah, I've, I've I'm good friends with a bunch of winemakers, and over the years have tasted stuff that, you know, they generally don't give to the public. You yeah. know, and you come out there yeah. and you cook for them at their house. And yeah. Their stuff that you get the goods. That yeah, way. the the hidden stuff, <laughs> yeah. the hidden gems. You yeah. know. Uh, which was which was fun. I mean, the private stash. Yeah, but there's been that's probably one of my favorite wines. But there's been some other stuff that's really good and really hard to find. But you know, I mean, over the years, you 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 tend to go back to the things that you like sure. more and more and more. Sure. So it's it's been good. Let me ask you a question. I, you sent me a picture, and it looked like he had a big old truffle in that picture. Was that picture, was that a truffle? It was. It was a big truffle. It was. So, Where'd you get that big old truffle? Because <laughs> that wasn't a cheap truffle. Uh, no, no, it was not. So, uh, 
Wait, for everybody that's listening and doesn't know what a truffle is, tell me what a truffle is. All right, so a truffle is a mushroom right. or a fungus, really, uh -huh. which is what mushrooms are. But yeah. uh, it's a fungus, but it grows only on oak trees on the roots below the ground, right? right? And they smell... They have a distinct smell. Very distinct. Very distinct smell, and they're very hard to find. <laughs> yeah, they, are. they used to use pigs yeah. to find them. Right. Now they use dogs because the dogs won't eat them. Right. The pigs will. I was going to say pigs would root around and, and find them. Yeah. Oh yeah, pigs. But you'd have to pull the pig off. But if you had a big enough pig, he'd pull you down to eat <laughs> yeah. the truffle. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so uh, France, Italy, uh, Oregon. There's some Australian. Um, there's. Some in yeah. in South Africa. I yeah. mean, but the the big ones are Italy and France. Yeah. I mean, those are the two big places to get them. Uh, so yeah. we were we were doing we wanted to do something crazy and right. get get us known a little bit better. And so we decided we were going to do some stuff with truffles, like the restaurant. Yeah, the restaurant okay, okay. at Culpeper. Okay. Sorry. Okay. And uh, we asked uh, we asked this guy out of New York, uh, the main big truffle dealer out yeah. of New York, and he said. Yeah, I mean, how big do you want? I said, no, I want the biggest one. <laughs> he said, well, well, they go up for auction when, oh, I, get, wow. when I get big ones in. Y'all like didn't. And I said, okay. So the first year uh, we tried to do it, he, they sold it to uh, Morimoto uh, oh, in, yeah. in New York. Yeah. And they didn't give me an opportunity to bid on it. And my owner at the restaurant at Culpepper has very deep pockets. And uh, and he was mad. So the next year, uh, they decided when it came in, he called me and he said, listen, this is a 1.2 pound truffle. It was as big as my hand. Yeah, I saw, yeah. Um, I thought it might be fake. I was looking, trying to see if it blowing up, see if it was fake or not. No. So it, was, it was the was... largest white truffle to come out of Italy that year. Okay. And it's it's still one of the top, I think, 10 or 12 truffles of all time to come out of Italy. Yeah. That, that's how big it was. Uh, we ended up paying, he called me and asked me, do you want to buy it straight up or do you want me to put it on auction? Oh. I said, I'll buy it straight up. He goes, it's going to cost you a little bit more. I said, I don't care. I said, you can you <laughs> you can walk it around town or take pictures. I said, I want it on my doorstep the next morning. He goes, it'll be there. $8,000. Yeah. Yeah, it was 1.2 pound, $8,000 truffle. So... We did a dinner with it. Um, I invited uh, seven uh, seven chefs, all right. and uh, so there were eight of us in all. And we did uh, an Italian wine dinner with um, with uh, Bert uh, Bertani uh -huh. Bertani wines. Oh yeah, and uh, they um, they shipped me stuff from Bertani, and yeah. I mean all kinds of cool wines. And we did uh, we did an eight course wine dinner. And oh wow! Eight eight different chefs. You got your course, and everybody got. It had to have truffle some way yeah, integrated. Yeah, and in, in, integrated in the dish. Yeah, so it was it was awesome. It okay, was so awesome. I want I want to tell you my truffle story. All right. So you know you know you went to see uh, you went to see Marcus right Paisley. Yep. yep. All right. So one day, one night I had to go dinner. I was going dinner down there, and I might have had. Some TX whiskey before dinner. Oh, okay. I was trying TX whiskey, and I might have been on my fourth or fifth glass. Okay. And I just drank TX straight. I don't drink, I don't juice it up with anything because I like the way it tastes. Right, right. I think if you're going to drink whiskey, any whiskey, any scotch, you should just drink it with ice, one cube of ice, and that's it. Yeah, that's usually the way I drink it. Yeah, that's what <laughs> I drink. So, and, and, and I don't I don't ever get ridiculous drunk or anything. I just get, you know, it'll, you know, feel good or whatever. And, and, but I didn't, so I would had four or five glasses of whiskey. I didn't have my glasses on, and the restaurant was dark. Let's take those three things into consideration. Okay, okay. And I'm sitting there, and Marcus comes out and goes, goes, hey, Trey, man, uh, put your sniffer on this. And it was a truffle about, you know, about, it was a white truffle from France, about, I don't know, about that big. Yeah. But it was a pretty good size. Well, I already didn't know what it was. I, I, I just took it. I was talking. I took it, and I bit it. I thought he said, take, try this. <laughs> I at the end of this thing, and took a huge hunk out of the side of this truffle, and he grabbed that thing, and his restaurant's open. And I saw him march back in the kitchen because it tasted like pure hell. Oh, yeah. You know, I'm trying oh, to yeah. chew this down, act like it didn't taste it. Didn't right. like it tasted all right. I saw him march back in the kitchen, 
and he was back to the left, and the chefs are wrong. And then Marcus came back out there to the table, and he said, "Do you know what you just did?" I said, "Yeah, I do now." And you know how much? You know how much, that was a three hundred dollar bite you took. Yeah. I'm like, well, you may pay for it. He's like, no, I'm just going to chalk up the experience. He started laughing. He's like, that's one of the funniest things I've ever seen in my life. I'll never forget this. <laughs> so he wrote this. He wrote this big story about it, and we put it, and we went on my website. Still, my website, Dane. It's just absolutely. It was. It was one of the most memorable things. He's he's never forgotten that. <laughs> ever forgotten that. Well, uh, I I want to I want to tell you thank you for sending me over to him, man. That was uh, that was one of the best experiences I've had. So guarantee that, you. Yeah, that guy is that guy's super awesome. Man. I will guarantee you when they when people ask me what, what's the best restaurant in Dallas Fort Worth, he's at, he's in the top three all the time. And most time for me, he's number one. Oh yeah, he's just fantastic. Yeah. What'd you have there? Um. Psh- we had probably five or six different dishes. See, um, he, he, here's what his deal. He doesn't advertise. No. He doesn't do print. He doesn't do a lot of media. He doesn't like doing that stuff. So he has just got a fantastic, or ser- a, ser- a serious place that is hidden. It's a, it's a treasure. Yeah, for sure. That once you go one time, you can't help but go back. Oh, yeah. No, I mean, I'm already thinking about my next trip over there. And I <laughs> having to come from Dallas all the way over here, I said, uh, maybe we'll just stay tonight and go back over to Clay Pigeon. Yeah. And, man. You know, my girlfriend was like, "Oh yeah, that's uh, well, I'm in." <laughs> <laughs> so it's uh, it's awesome, man. I I did you enjoy, enjoy Marcus? It. Yeah, he's a great I, guy, isn't yeah. he? Yeah, I got to talk to with him for probably 15 minutes or so. I mean, it was a busy Friday night, I think, when we went. And Incredibly talented chef, very one of the very, most talented. Very, very. Uh, good. I, I like to I like to look at people like that and go, man. I hope people think that I'm the way I think about these chefs, sure. you know? So that's, you know, kind of your mentorship around the culinary community is you look at different chefs and go, sure. man, I really like the way this guy is. He's, you know, cool, calm, collected. He's a really good chef, really talented. That's the kind of chef I want to be. He is very calm and collected. You know his idol was? Did you see the big picture on the uh, Marco? Oh, yeah, yeah. You Marco see that big Pierre picture? White. Yep. Yeah. That yeah. was his idol, and he's and he's he's not, he's not like that though. Oh no, he's not like that at no. all. <laughs> no, but isn't that funny? It's no. so funny. I know. But he but he took all the best qualities. Oh yeah, and said this is the way I'm going to do it. But nowadays, there's no way like his restaurant's completely open. That's yeah. why I like I like oh, yeah. him, like Abacus was. Yeah. Uh, but you can't be hollering throwing stuff on open restaurants. People won't come back. They get uncomfortable. Right. Nowadays, they get uncomfortable. Right. Very. Very. So, and that's, I mean, you know, they want to see, they want to see how. The chef works right. mind wise, but they can't understand, you know, why Gordon Ramsay's that way and that way on TV. Well, he's not like that in the restaurant. <laughs> no. you know? He's like that for TV, not for yeah. general purposes yeah. and being in a restaurant because you yeah. won't get anything done. Yeah. You know? You offend people. Yeah, very now, much. Nowadays you do. Very much. Used to, I think, it was the, it was the ideology of chefs. They, they were like that because that's the way they were trained. But nowadays, you, you'll be in, you'll, they'll, see you, they'll put you in court. You can't. Oh, yeah, no. yeah. You, that you'll, won't work. You'll go away quick. Yeah, <laughs> you go away real quick. Yeah, real fast. Yeah, you have some restaurant owner sued oh, if yeah. it's not your restaurant. Yeah, definitely. Um, so what was your favorite thing that you ate at Clay Pigeon? Um, we tried the uh, pot pie. He had a, a bird pot pie oh, that man. was quail. Duck and chicken. Oh Lord! Oh my I bet gosh. that was delicious. Oh my gosh! <laughs> it was. It was absolutely fantastic. <laughs> yeah, fantastic. Yeah. That his uh, mac and cheese was awesome. I mean, just you know, we had a bunch. Uh, we drank a lot of whiskey yeah. that night too. So, <laughs> what, what were you drinking? TX. Uh, I usually drink either TX or uh, if you had Lone Elm. No. Uh, so Lone Elm is one of a uh, friend of mine. Uh, represents it. It's out of Forney, Texas, and it's right down the street from my house. So um, yeah. we, we drink either one of those. But I I do like the TX, and their new facility is awesome. Oh, man. it's incredible. It's awesome. It's unbelievable. So. You, it is uh, incredible is what it is. Oh, yeah. You, it's it's, it's mind-blowing. Oh, yeah. Because sure. to go from where, that, just a short time ago, a short time ago, right. they were in a warehouse. Oh, yeah. And they, they didn't just bite off a little bit and change a little bit. They went literally from like a, a, a horse and mule. Right. Uh, I mean, a, a mule and a cart to a, the Grand Palace. I know. And that place is fantastic. Man. <laughs> fantastic. I've never seen the same thing twice in their, in their lounge. Their bar area is tremendous. Oh, yeah. Super cool. Super cool. Plus, they got uh, 
Don't they got the little golf course? Yeah, whole, whole 18 hole golf course. Yeah. I was like, oh my gosh, this is. They got a bunch of stuff out there. Fantastic. So they got we can put, pitch all, do all kind of games and stuff. It's phenomenal. Mm -hmm. They make all those craft cocktails and they have a whole big area. They do all kinds of cooking classes. Oh yeah, it is, and they have all those barrels. It is, it's just I can't. Even, it's it's one of the coolest places I've been to. Oh yeah, for sure. I do want to take a trip over to, uh, to. Uh, um, Ireland and see some of those whiskey. Old, I, I really do want to. And they're not going to be as nice as that, but the history. The history is where you The at. history yeah. and the knowledge and just sitting there soaking it up. Oh, yeah. Feeling it. So I've been to uh, I've been to Ireland one time, and I got to go to uh, the Guinness, the uh, St. James Gate. Yeah, where they was make that Guinness. fun? Super cool. Super, super cool. And then uh, we also got to go through uh, Jameson, and it was uh, it was super cool, man. I mean... You know, and you can, you can tell me all you want, but I can go through a lineup and pick out Jameson every stinking time. Yeah. And be like, which one is it? That's Jameson, Jameson. right there. <laughs> uh, might have drinking a little bit of that before. <laughs> <laughs> hey, is it is which which one do they use the peat over there? Because I know I watched a show where they were digging out peat. Um, most know? of the time, that's in Scotland. Okay. Uh, Ireland tends to not use as much, uh, if any at all, but. I mean, it so the show I saw, I don't remember where it was some. So Pete makes it smoky, makes it smoky, correct? Yeah, it kind of gives it that, like what Scotch tastes like. Yeah, that's the more of the peat that they use uh, while they're distilling it. So, so what? What's your favorite Scotch, or what's your favorite to cook with Scotch or whiskey or a blend? What? Um, usually, bourbon. usually bourbon. Yeah, and I'm I'm a big uh, Maker's Mark guy. Yeah. behind the scenes. <laughs> so yeah, uh, but yeah, I mean. Uh, we we'll use a lot of Maker's Mark. Uh, I, I just use bourbon in general. It doesn't I, really matter. I love the marketing of Maker's Mark, that wax on that bottle. Yeah. I mean, I just think it's still one of the best-looking bottles on the market. Oh, man, it's fantastic. So Noticeable. Uh, I'm, an, I'm an ambassador to Maker's Mark, uh, and you sign up. Basically, they have a free online deal where you sign up, and you can get your name on a barrel. And then it shows you, there's an app now, and it shows you when your barrel comes to maturity, and they send you an email, so my email just came in. I've been waiting seven years for it. Are you serious? Dead serious. So from April to June, you can go to the distillery and take a picture with your name on the barrel. It's like there's like 20 names on a plaque on a barrel, and you can uh, and you can get the whiskey out of that barrel, and you can dip your own um, wax, your the tops to them. Oh, that is a neat deal. So, guess what I'm doing? <laughs> <laughs> That's one of my main things. I've never been up there, and I want to go so I, bad. I've never been either. Where are they? Uh, they're in Lexington. Kentucky. Yeah. Loretta, yeah. Lexington area. Yeah. It's it's right there on the That's not that trail. far from here. No. Nah, That's a snack of a drive. Oh, yeah. I mean, maybe 10, 12 yeah. hours. Yeah, so, it's quick. Yeah, I want to. Beautiful country. I know. I definitely want to go drive to it. Yeah, so. I love They still hand dip all those bottles. Hand dip. I, I just watched a show on that, yep. you know. I, I try to watch all the shows I can on 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 drinking and breweries and distilleries and food because it just I just soak the knowledge up because what I do now. Right. So I saw so I just saw a show where they were hand dipping those every one of them still. I, that's so cool how they dip them and they twist them and bring them up. Yep. And so you can you can go do that now. They said you can only I think it's you can only take seven bottles at a time because that's all they're allowed to sell uh, to one person in one day. Yeah. You can go back multiple days and get the same. I guess it has something to do with the bootleg, the laws, or the yeah, bootlegger laws yeah, from, the, from the old time. It was not, yeah. yeah, I mean, so uh, they were like, uh, make sure you bring a lot of people with you if you want. <laughs> if you want multiple bottles of your whiskey in your barrel, I was yeah. like, all right, so uh, definitely got to bring uh, my fiance, my best friend, my, <laughs> you know, anybody I can get to go. Yeah. Let's go do it now. Well, how much do they charge you per bottle? Is it, is it is it the big bottle? What size bottle is it? It's the regular size bottles, okay. the seven fifties. But they give them, I think they give you uh, a discounted price because you're an ambassador. So, I mean, I don't know what it is. I haven't I haven't researched it that far, but yeah. it doesn't matter. I'm it going. won't matter. Yeah, I'm going yeah. one way or another. Yeah, so. that's fun. <laughs> yeah. So, what is your favorite thing to cook with 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 bourbon? Like, if you had if you had to cook one dish, if someone said you can only cook one dish tonight, what would be the favorite di your favorite dish you would cook with bourbon? Uh, but it has to be infused with bourbon. It's got to be infused with bourbon. Um, I'll probably do something with uh, venison, uh, just because I like it so much. Yeah. Um, I would probably do uh, something with some wild mushrooms, and do something uh, deglaze with bourbon and make a sauce with like. Uh, like either bourbon, brown sugar, 
Um, I'm big into uh, like some tart berries, either a cherry or a currant, um, and make like a little sauce with all that kind of putting that with the venison. Currant's got unusual flavor to it. Definitely. What, definitely. What? Tart. Yeah. There's there's almost like a sweet tart. Yeah. Uh, but it's weird. Yeah. I mean, it's not. Uh, I don't know. It's just weird. I've never really got into it, but I mean, I'll eat it, but it's, it's, like, it's definitely distinctive. They're, they're definitely different. Definitely yeah. different. But those are, that's one of the things about being a chef is trying to figure all that kind of stuff sure. out and make it, you know, make it nice and clean. Um, I like to, you know, I mean, I do a lot of fresh herbs, uh, especially being in Texas, you know, uh, sage and rosemary and thyme and stuff like that. I, I, you know, crust up a nice venison loin and make Jack it. that flavor profile oh up, baby. Oh, my gosh. Bro. Flavor rodeo in your mouth. Hell yeah. Yeah. Hell yeah. <laughs> All right, so I want to talk about Abacus because that's where I met you the first time. Perfect. Abacus, two, two, two years ago, three, I don't know. Two to three, yeah, two to something three. like that. So that was a fantastic restaurant. Was. And I'm going to tell you something, really, if you're not going to believe this. Okay. So yesterday I'm sitting in my Mac working. I'm working on my hamburger story for last year. Where I was trying to get it finished up, so get, get it over to my editor. But I was working on this story, and all of a sudden it came on TV. Because what I do is I, I record all these shows. Okay. T- I don't record them. You get TV or whatever the hell you do to them. Right. Uh, the, the technology terms change so much for that. So, right. and, I, and I let them, I play them, I let them run in the background. And, and, and I had just turned it on. I was working on a hamburger story. I just looked at your picture with a truffle. And I'll be damned, this thing that comes on the TV and goes, and the best thing I've ever eaten, it's on that best show, best thing I ever ate, was the lobster shooters at Abacus in <laughs> Dallas, Texas. That's funny. I'm like, oh, my God. Because truthfully, that's one of the best things I've ever eaten. Right. That was, remember I had y'all bring me six more? That was a phenomenal dish. Right. That thing was delicious. So tell me, but we'll talk about Abacus, but, and then we're going to talk about the school I went to because that with you, that because oh, yeah, that yeah, school yeah. was phenomenal. Yeah. Um, uh, but tell me how the lobster shooters made and how y'all did that. Who created that? Uh, that was the <clears throat> the was chef Kent? before us. Yeah, Kent Rathman. Okay. Uh, so he did that. Um, and when I got to Abacus, he had just left. Right. So he was he left in uh, August or September of 2016, and I started in January of 2017. Okay. So he had just left, but yeah, he created those, and they're still on the menu over at Jasper's right now. At, yeah. at the uptown location yeah. only. Oh right. yeah, right. Yeah. The the it's it's just it, the combination. Of, why has nobody copied that? Why aren't there a hundred different restaurants doing that? Because it's so good. Um, I think one of the things is they're really, really labor intensive. Yeah. Uh, I mean, you're talking, you know, six per order. Well, they're each handmade. Right. I mean, so each little dumpling's handmade, and there's one lady that does it, and she's pretty much the only one that knows the exact recipe because I've seen four different versions of the recipe and not one of them tastes like the way she makes them. So I don't it, know. It, it's it's savory, creamy. It, it is, and it's just loaded with flavor. It's just yeah. one shot deal. And yeah. so it's got tequila, right? No. It's what, got, what, what's in there? So there's, there's uh, coconut milk, okay. sake. Um, there's rice mirin right. or rice wine. Right. Um, there is uh, cilantro, mint, basil. Um, <laughs> That's such a great combination. There is red, uh, red bell peppers. There's ginger, lemongrass. Uh, now, is that all emulsified and put in a sauce? Is that what it is? Yeah. Okay. That's all emulsified into the sauce and right. then strained out through it. Right. But the sauce takes about an hour to make, and we make about, we were making about six. Uh, about six gallons at a time. Holy crap! Yeah, they're that, that popular. Oh yeah, uh, everybody. I mean, everybody walks in the door and gets those. You know, very few. You know, I, I, that's what I do. For, it's what you do to your chef. But for I do it for a living. I eat food all week long. Right. All week long, I eat different dishes. Right. And when I had that dish, it just blew me. I mean, because I, I wasn't expecting it. Right. You know. I, right. I think I didn't know. Already, y'all just brought it out to me. Right. To yeah. try. Yeah. I never had it. Well, I think I said, I know I never had that. And you said, you've never had a lot. So y'all brought it out, and I was just stunned at the flavor. I mean, I couldn't believe it. Yep. That's why I ordered some more. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, they're, uh, yeah he came up with those um, a long, long time ago. I mean, that restaurant was there for 20 years. Yeah. Right? 20 years. Now, was he a partner in that deal? Yeah, he was. Okay, and he yep. left. Okay. Yeah. Because he's done a lot of restaurants. Yep. Yeah. He's got a few more now. Yeah, right? he's got the one down. Uh, I'm going to have him on the show here, too, pretty quick. Um, uh Emoto. Emoto, Emoto yeah. yeah. Have you been there? No, I have not. I have not either. I'm I sure it's not. good. Yeah, I'm sure it is. Yeah. Is one of our 
Uh, another colleague of mine is his uh, sous chef, and he's a good dude too. Okay, cool. So. All right, so I so I went to Abacus Trial Food. It was awesome, and then but then I went to the school. I, I was invited to go to the school, and I went to the school, right. y'all. And that school was phenomenal. What was that school called? So um, we do cooking classes, and right. it was called the Dirty Dozen. Right, Dirty Dozen. That's right. I love so, the name too. Yeah. So it's twelve people. Uh, they come in on a Sunday when we're closed. Um, we have. Usually we have four chefs, so it'll be the executive chef, which was Chris Patrick right. at the time, uh, me, exec Sue, uh, our sous chef uh, was Craig, and then um, our pastry chef. And so you get broken up, and everybody gets uh, three people, and right. you get uh, the experience of whatever right. we're doing that day. Uh, I can't remember what we were doing. Were we doing barbecue? Yeah, you know, yeah, no, yeah, you were some. Yes, you were, because you were smoking out back. Okay, so... yeah. Uh, so that theme was the barbecue yeah. theme or whatever. And so uh, you learn from the chef right. um, how to do whatever he's doing that day. That day was barbecue. Yeah. So uh, I don't even remember what I was doing. But, um, you know, you've got three people and you've got to make dishes. So they get there at 2. Uh, we start cooking around 2.30. And then they get to bring a guest uh, to come eat with right. them around five thirty, six o'clock. And during the whole process, there's, you know, you're tasting and sampling stuff, right. but the wine starts coming yeah. around and we yeah. have a good time with that. But, you know, they get, uh, they get to bring somebody and sit down with it. And it was, it was just super cool. We did yeah. it about once a month, once every I, other month. I remember getting there at one o'clock right. and then, and then not leaving until after dark. I mean, oh. I was there a long time, but I loved it. It was, it was riveting. It was just, it, there was always something going on. Right. I was taking pictures, watching everybody work. I do remember, was it Chris gave the speech before or you? No, maybe you get. It was probably me, the safety speech. Yeah. Oh, well, yeah. The, the thing that stuck out of my mind the most was that I thought what somebody should know, just, just common sense. But y'all told me it's a big deal. Is act like everything's a hundred thousand degrees or a thousand degrees. Don't touch anything without a. Yeah. And, and obviously that comes from people don't think. Right. Uh, if right. You, I guess if you don't, if you're not around the restaurant business, you're not in the back of the house. You don't think about everything being hot. Right. But it's the truth. Right. I mean, you know, when you're at the house or something like that, you know, most of the time your pans don't get that hot. Yeah. What people fail to realize is when you're in a kitchen, everything's hot all the time yeah. it's always on and it's always on the highest it can go <laughs> yeah. it's not like we have an oven on 350 yeah. the oven's on 500 all the time <laughs> the the burners are on all the time yeah. they Full blast. yeah they don't stop you yeah. know and that's what people fail to realize and even things that you might not think would be hot like you're walking to the freezer to grab something well, let's say I'm trying to cool something off that just came out of a 500 degree oven. Yeah, I go put it right in the freezer, and you walk in right after me, going, "Oh, everything in here is frozen," <laughs> and you grab it. <laughs> yeah. So chefs, you know this. Chefs yeah. always have towels in their hands. Yeah. We always have a towel on us, and that's yeah. just the way we work. Uh, it's so that smart. Was, it's oh, smart yeah. practice. Yeah, I mean, it just you train yourself. Yeah, very much so. <laughs> after you burn yourself a few times, you'll you'll yeah. get it. So Abacus, Abacus closed down. They made a transformation. They're now Jaspers. Jaspers, yeah. Uh, what was your favorite thing at Abacus to cook? Um, your favorite dinner? My favorite dinner? Um, we did a we did a pretty cool dinner with uh, Veuve Clicquot wines, uh, mm -hmm. champagne. Uh, and we did like a five-course dinner with them um, two years in a row. And it was, and their champagnes are so good. But we, I mean, we did some phenomenal stuff. Um, we did a lot of... Uh, a lot of game at right. Abacus as well, just because Chris uh, went to school. He went to school here, but uh, he worked in Colorado for a while. So me and him got along real well. And yeah, we did. I, 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 I could tell y'all's uh, the way y'all worked together. I thought you got along fantastic. Oh yeah, I mean we're still. Uh, I've only known him since 2017, and I feel you, like uh, you wouldn't think that. I thought y'all were long time buddies. Yeah, I mean it's yeah. it's crazy. We've been in the same circle of chef friends since 2000 and had never met each other until I walked in the door and he went, how do you know all these people? I said, well, uh, how do I, how do you know all these people? And it was just one of those things. We became best friends right off the bat. So, um, I, I watch people and, you know, personality wise, that's right. what I do. And, uh, relationships, you know, you, t to be successful, you, you had in today's times for me or any time really, you got to be, you have to build successful relationships. And you and Chris, you know, all worked really well together. The relationship was, I could tell, was just, no, there was no problem with trust or anything in, in that relationship. No. Yeah, I walked in the door and he looked at me and he said, uh, yep, you're it. You're the guy. <laughs> Get in the kitchen. He's like, 
figure it out. And it took me about, you know, three, four days to figure it out. Yeah. And he was like, are you good? I'm like, yeah, I'm fine. I'm perfect. <laughs> no big deal. So, so so what is your, I want to ask you what's your most, what is the most significant thing about being a chef to you? What is the one thing that you could say that you're proud of about being a chef? Um, I'm very artistic, uh, you know, style wise, I'm very, very artistic. And for me, I don't think artists get enough recognition. Um, I agree. I and, agree. and most of the time, uh, they have to be dead to get recognition right, right. about whatever they did right. or are doing or yes. whatever. Uh, for me, it's the instant gratification of here's my art. Here's my best thing I can do today. And I'm going to sit in front of you and you can look right back at me and go, holy crap. Yeah. This is the best thing I've ever had. And it makes me feel awesome as a person and awesome as a chef to go, you know, I'm leading all these guys and all these kitchens and this is this is my See. art. This is my Insta gratification art. Awesome. Ted, thank you. Thank you, Trey. See y'all next week. Trey Shout Out Live. Same time, same back channel. Trey Chapman, publisher of TraceChowdown.com. I'm passionate about finding the best food, drinks, and chefs to sharing it all with you. I should know I have over five decades of food experience. Find me on any podcast platform, Facebook Live, or just Google me. Now you can watch and listen to all my great finds every week on my live TV and radio podcast at Trey's Chowdown Live.